Hey everyone, welcome to the uh, first lecture in international politics. Um, it's just going to be a short lecture for the, the first day. Really, um, the goal is to kind of introduce some of the concepts and some of the language that we're going to be using um, in this course. Uh, some of the languages and concepts are a little bit different from some of what you may have seen in your other courses in international politics. Um, sometimes it just gets a little bit, takes a little bit of time um, at the start of semester for students to get comfortable um with some of the theories and some of the, the terms that we're using um which you know like i said aren't things that you would have heard too frequently so i want to take advantage of as many classes as i can to try to get repeating some of them to try to be building understanding so that when we use some of these terms in, in you know in the next next class rather than explaining it at the same time um, you'll have some basic understanding of what it is and hopefully you know across different lectures we'll build understanding um if at the end of today, there's some of the terms you're still not completely comfortable with. That's okay. Don't worry. That's normal. Um, they'll be clarified um, in time, or you'll get a better understanding than them. Same thing with some of the theories. Um, we're going to be starting with a lot of the theories at the beginning of the course. Students are often a little bit confused um, on some of them at first, but once um, we start applying them, um, they, and once you see other theories and kind of how they relate together, um, it makes it a little bit easier to understand. Um, so let's get started. All right, so why do we study IR? And IR is just the abbreviation for international relations. Um, you'll see it um, more commonly than you'll see international re relations written, and you'll see IR instead. Um, so to discover the causes and consequences of conflict and cooperation between states and other international actors. So we'll learn a little bit more about how we define states and other international actors later, but let's start with the uh, causes and consequences, right? So we're looking at conflict and cooperation. So why does conflict happen? And what are the effects of conflict on our lives, on people? Um, and same thing for cooperation. Why sometimes do we see, you know, Canada, the US um, cooperating? Um, and what, what are the outcomes of cooperation? What does that do for our lives? Does it make our lives better? Does it make our lives worse? Um, so how, um, why do some states cooperate and sometimes, uh, um, and other states have, uh, experience conflict? And why do we have conflict with one state at one time, but cooperation at another time, or conflict on one issue, but cooperation on another? Um, so um, that's a good part of what IR is trying to figure out um, is, um, kind of the patterns uh, for conflict and cooperation, why they happen and what are the effects. Um, another definition from a, um, one of the earlier scholars in IR, um, so this is kind of a reprint the year 2006, but this would have been more in the, uh, the 1950s, early 1950s. Uh, so to understand the forces that determine uh, political relations among international actors within the international system. And I put italics on international actors within the international system, because that's what we're going to try to unpack um, for the rest of kind of the definitions to a large part, um, the terms of international system, which is going to recur with a lot of these theories and international actors. Who are the actors? When we talk about international relations, you know, in domestic politics, we understand, you know, you've got the voters, you've got parliament, you've got uh, cabinet, you've got the prime minister, you've got the court, you've got the province. We kind of understand at an intuitive level who participates in, in domestic politics and Canadian politics, but we don't necessarily have that same understanding of who are the participants in international politics. So that's uh, something that we'll try to unpack as well. So what is the international system? So the international system is a set of relationships among the world's states structured according to certain rules and patterns of internet uh, interactions. Um, so a set of relations among the world states. So the international system then is a set of relation, uh, relationships uh, and we're looking at the world states. Now, some would say it goes, would go beyond um, the world state to other international actors as well. Um, and these aren't just random relationships, right? There are certain rules and patterns of interactions that exist. And those patterns, those rules and those patterns of interaction together make up the international system. So we don't just have states just existing in nothingness. Um, they, um, they all kind of have certain, um, you know, if you want to figure out what's going to happen between Canada, the US or China and the US, uh, right? You, you, there's certain things you could guess because there's certain ways that international politics are done. There's certain rules of behavior and there's certain typical patterns of uh, 
interaction, right? And these build up certain relations, and then from those we have the international system. So what are international actors? Um, and we'll unpack more of different international systems and kind of the structure of this system. What are the rules that operate? What are the patterns we see? We'll unpack more about the international system and what the international system, how the international system affects actors. Um, we'll learn more about that when we start getting into theories. But the main thing to understand here is just kind of the idea that it's a set of relationships, right? So we've got all the different actors within the international system. They're having relationships, and these relationships are patterned, right? And these relationships, according to those patterns, create the international system, right? So the international system is, to a certain extent, always changing, right? Because if you, whenever you get new states, um, whenever the rules change, whenever the patterns of interaction change, uh, if the relationships change, right, that makes some transformations in the international system. So what are international actors? So an actor is any person or body whose decisions and actions have repercussions for international politics. Okay, that's a little bit vague, um, but purposely so, in that it's trying to show that any person, so any individual participating in international politics, um, but also any body, so any group, uh, decisions or actions have repercussions, so have effects on international politics, right? So the primary goal may not to be the in influence of international politics, but the decisions they make influence international politics or the relations between states or other um, or have some effect on the international system, then um, that is an international actor. So to get a little bit more precise, we have states and then we have a variety of non-state actors also. Um, so these non-state actors might include things like multinational corporations, intergovernmental organizations and non-governmental organizations. So we'll come back to non-state actors in a little bit. I just wanna start with a brief discussion about what are states. So a state is a particular type of political unit that has two crucial characteristics, territoriality and sovereignty, right? So when we talk about territoriality, we're talking about a defined territory, right? So if, we're, if we look at Canada, right, we could look at a map and say, these are the boundaries that are Canada, Right? And these are the boundaries outside of here is not Canada, right? So in particular, because we only have one neighbor, right? We could say, you know, north of this line is Canada, south of this line is the United States. And then on, on the other side, it's a little bit more obvious, land and then water, but even within the water, right? There's agreed upon kind of every country gets a certain amount of the continental shelf um, um, and kind of sea areas outside um, of their territory. So it's often it's 200 nautical miles. Um, so even there, if we take into the water, right, we could take from Canada's, um, you know, land border all the way 200 nautical miles out. And then, um, you know, you have the boundaries of Canada, right? So for each country, they have to have a fixed and defined territory and they have to have sovereignty, right? And you can think of sovereignty as control over that territory. Um, so, um, in, within the Canadian territory, we have the Canadian government who exercises control over what happens in within Canada. And so each, um, and, and that's a concept that will be coming back when we start talking about inter, uh, you know, international law or some of the different theories, um, is that sovereignty is actually a really important concept um, in um, international politics in that, um, you know, many norms of international politics, you know, say that, um, other states aren't supposed to interfere in the domestic politics of other states, right? So, um, you you know, they could have contentious relations between each other, but each state is sovereign, um, has authority over what happens within their own territory, and others are not supposed to interfere. Um, so, one of um, one of the issues where sovereignty could come up. So, some places where statehood. Um, could be more problematic. This sound, probably sounds really easy, but think about certain, um, some states or um, take Somalia, for example, or Syria, for example, right, where um, the government doesn't necessarily have complete control over, its, um, you know, we, we could say this is the government of Somalia, this is the government of Syria, but if we say, you know, Okay, so are they able to control what's happening in the entirety of the territory of Somalia or Syria? We'd have to say no. There is, um, the government isn't sovereign over the entire territory because there's certain, you know, uh, 
rebel groups or um, organizations that control certain parts of the um, of the territory and the government forces aren't really able to penetrate into those areas and provide services in those areas, provide control, have authority over those reasons, right? So that causes problems for, um, for statehood. Um, in the case of, you know, countries like Somalia, we often refer to it as a, a, um, sometimes use the language of a failed state, right? So it's a state, but that has failed and it's failed in terms of it doesn't have sovereignty over the entirety of its territory. Um, in Canada, so even a, a Canada is a country where we would think about, you know, sovereignty would never be a problem. But in recent years, there's been, um, you know, a push for um, uh, trying to get, um, uh, you know, control over Arctic resources and mapping the continental shelves um, in the Arctic to see who controls what, you know, water resources. How far does Canada's continental shelf go out? Um, so that then we could apply the kind of um, you know, the uh, exclusive economic zones beyond there that we're supposed to have control of within the water so that we can then get any resource at the bottom. And all the Arctic states have been doing this. Um, and Canada, one of the measures Canada's had to do in trying to make its claim for Arctic control um, has been to increase its resources up in the Arctic. Because one of the questions that Canada's always going to face in its territorial claims over the Arctic um, and some of his quota claims over the Arctic was, does Canada really have sovereignty over the Arctic? Does Canada, you know, if something, if something goes um, wrong up in the Arctic, can Canada really get up there and control it? Um, if any country were to try to, you know, um, move troops or scientists or anything into our territory, would we even know about it and be able to do it, uh, do anything about it? Um, so um, there's kind of been with the, um, concept that some who studied the Canadian Arctic have talked about is in terms of use it or lose it. If Canada doesn't in some form have some way where it can use the Arctic, then it could lose it. Um, so it has to have some form of sovereignty even up there or no one's gonna take our Arctic claim seriously. Um, so, so far I've been using the, the term state. Um, country, state, nation, and nation state are often used interchangeably. Um, now, um, country and state, I think, are, are, are good, solid terms for it. Nation is one that should be avoided. Um, and um, since, uh, you know, this being taught in Quebec, the, the reason for that should be more apparent, right? We've got the Quebec is a nation, right, within Canada, a separate nation within Canada, or the Quebecois are a separate nation within Canada. Nation, so therefore, also refers to a group who share a common cultural identity without necessarily having um, sovereignty, um, so without necessarily being a state. So because of nation's kind of dual meaning of sometimes being country, but sometimes being this uh, sociological term of a group who shares a common cultural identity, it could lead to confusion if you say nation, um, and nation state is a term that we used to always use because it typically was you had one group who shared a, a common cultural identity per state, right? So if you think of a, you know, a state like Denmark, right? That's a fairly homogenous state where within Denmark, um, you have one nation of you know, Danish people living. So you could refer to it as a nation within a state, right? Or nation state, a one nation in the state. But now you have so many multinational states, take Canada, um, for example, um, the UK um, would be a multinational state. You have so many states that are multinational that it's no longer as useful as a term, but you may at different times in readings see these terms used interchangeably. So where does the state system come from? Uh, so when we talk about international politics, we're generally referring to the Westphalian system of sovereign states. And it's perfectly fine if you've never heard of Westphalian system of, of sovereign states, right? So the Treaty of Westphalia, um, which was in 1648, ended the Thirty Years' War. Um, it was one, which was one of the deadliest uh, wars in European history and was fought primarily over religion. And so you kind of, before then, had um, some sense of kind of country, or, but more like feudal. So you had like, you had different kings, but you also had the church kind of interfering in politics. Um, so there's fights between kind of political entities between religious entities who were also political within the Thirty Years' War. Uh, uh, the, 30 years war. the Peace of Westphalia um, 
helped create the modern anarchic, we'll return to anarchy later, uh, state system and the principle of state sovereignty, right? So at the end of this war, it kind of was the idea that kind of religion should get out of states. And so states should become political entities and no outside actors, right? So within France, a fr French king at the time, would have been a king, French king was sovereign over what happens in France. And the French king is not supposed to interfere what happens in Spain, um, right? And the Spanish king is not supposed to interfere with what happens in France. And the uh, British king or uh, English king isn't supposed to interfere with what happens in France and vice versa, right? So the idea of to try to avoid these wars in the future was kind of to make it um, uh, um, to create these states with kind of more firm boundaries, boundaries so territoriality and sovereignty. Um, and part of that sovereignty is the idea of not interfering in other um, states. Um, and so that's where we, when we talk about anarchic state system, we're talking about a state system where you have different countries who have territoriality and sovereignty. And when we're talking about anarchy, we mean um, we're talking about where there's no central government above it. So above these states, there's no world government who can police, right? So it uh, doesn't mean chaos, and we'll refer to, re return to anarchy later, but it doesn't mean chaos. It just means you've got these different states who are operating um, with control of their own territory. They're, um, they have relations with other states, but there's no world government above them. There's nobody above them to who can step in where it, if I'm having relation, if I'm having like interactions with, you know, another person in Canada, there's a government I can go to above me. Um, if we have a, some form of conflict, there's no government I can go to. There's no government that France can go to or Canada can go to above them um, into international politics. So alternatives to the state system. Um, so you, you could have different anarchic systems. So right now we have the Westphalian state system, but there's also been other anarchic systems in the form of city states. Um, so before you had countries, you often had political organization around city states. Um, and so um, those also had no, you know, powers they could go to above them. They had control over their own cities. So the leaders of the city had control over their own cities. Um, and if they came into conflict with somebody else, they could make allies with other city states, but there was no like courts they could go to or world government they could go to to say, stop this. Um, feudal systems. So what we had before. Before, largely before the Westphalian state system. So where you have um, kind of, you know, different levels of authority. So you might have a king, but you also would have different lords having control over their territory. Um, and then you have imperial systems. So if you think back to um, something like um, ancient Rome, um, where um, it wasn't quite anarchic because everything was controlled out of the, the center. There's a central authority that does control most of um, uh, international politics because everything pretty much happens within that empire. So imperial system. Think of Rome. Um, some make the the uh, the argument that the U.S. has at certain points entered into a pseudo imperial system. Uh, it's not something we're going to talk too much about in in, in this course, um, but uh, just uh, bear it in mind. So who are uh, international actors? Right, so we've got uh, non-state actors, so um, multinational corporations, um, international organizations like the UN and OPEC, so the intergovernmental organizations like uh, the UN or um, organization petroleum exporting countries. Um, so, um, you know, these are different organizations that bring together different governments. Um, we could have a couple of lectures on on those, and then non-governmental organizations. Right, so these are international organizations um, that operate across boundaries, right? So you, like Amnesty International has members in many, many, many countries in the world. And they operate on international politics. They have influences on international politics. Um, but governments are not members. So Greenpeace, Red Cross, Amnesty International. So when we talk about international organizations later, we'll talk a little bit about them. We'll also, when we talk about political economy, talk a little bit about multinational corporations. Um, but um, I just want to show kind of a, a quick slide to show that um, how important multinational corporations can be. So when we talk about the international system, we talk tend to think primarily about states. And for good reason, states are still the most important actors in international politics, right? But corporations, you know, particularly when we're talking about 
smaller state corporations can have a lot of power. And so here's a slide with um, top 100 countries or corporations in terms of their economic size. So either GDP or um, revenue for corporations, right? And so this is a few years old, so the numbers aren't gonna be exactly right. Um, so revenue for, for um, countries and for um, uh, corporations. So the numbers are a little bit old. Some of the, the rankings will have moved around, but the idea here is just, um, if anything, corporations would have done better. So, um, like I said, some of the rankings will change, but the idea stays the same. So we've got US as the first, China, Germany, Japan, France, UK, Italy, Brazil, Canada, there's us, um, Walmart. So Walmart has more revenue than Spain, Australia, Netherlands, State Grid, China National Petroleum, uh, Cinepec Group, South Korea, Royal Shell. So Royal Shell has more revenue than Mexico and Sweden, followed by Exxon Mobil, which is just below Sweden, uh, Volkswagen, Toyota, India, Apple, Belgium, uh, BP, Switzerland, Norway, Russia, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, so going on. And I think I counted at one point, I think 73 of the top 100 um, were corporations. And there's something like 193 countries in the world. Um, so 73 and so 27 of them. So think of um, how many, most of the countries, very, a very, very tiny percent of the countries are even on the top 100 list. So what happens if Walmart with its revenue goes to you know, the country that would be number 50, or just on the list of countries. So it'd probably be here's something like number 500 or 600 on the list of economic entities. What if Walmart says, we're gonna come into this country and bring this many jobs, right? But for us to do that, you need to do this, this, and this. Do you think the country really has a choice but to say yes? Um, so yes, countries have all kinds of powers, to set laws and, um, many, many different resources that um, corporations don't have. But corporations do have a lot of power, particularly when we're dealing with some of the smaller countries, but even with the bigger ones. I mean, look, on this list, Walmart's right behind Canada and is above Spain, right? So with some of the largest corporations, just to show their sheer size and scale. And then what, as we're moving forward, one of the things to think about will be what we refer to as the levels of analysis, right? So when we're thinking about explanation for conflict or cooperation, because remember international politics is looking at the causes and consequences of um, cooperation and conflict. So we use the levels of analysis um, to kind of organize some of our explanations. Some of the time we'll look for our explanation at the international system. So again, the relationships between states. So what are the patterns or the rules for the relationships between states? Um, and so we'll be looking for patterns up there. What are the dynamics of the international system that can cause conflict? What different patterns of relationships can cause conflict? We can look at the nation state or what we refer to at the domestic level. So things we might look at there is, you know, is conflict more likely if the country is democratic or non-democratic? Um, or what about if it's two democracies versus um, uh, two non-democracies? Um, what about a parliamentary versus presidential system? What about different economic systems within the state? Does that have impact on uh, likelihood of conflict or cooperation? And then finally, at the end of the day, it's individuals who make decisions in international politics as in all politics, right? So we could look at for it, the source of the individual. So was, um, what role did Hitler play in um, World War II? Would we had a World War II without Hitler? Um, what, so what role did do leaders, individuals make in causing international politics? Um, so that's the third source and we'll look at that um, as well. So some of the different theories will focus, so the theory we're gonna talk on uh, about next time, focuses is largely at the international system. The second one we're gonna do looks largely at the domestic level. And then a little bit later in the course, we're gonna look at the individual. So that's all for today. Um, I hope, uh, I know it's a lot of definitions, so it's not the most fun, um, but I hope it, um, it, it will help you understand, have a better understanding for kind of what we're gonna be looking at in the course and, um, and how some of these theories are gonna come into play. So have a uh, wonderful um, rest of your day and uh, talk to you uh, next time.